Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. In a world where people feel chaos and uncertainty, especially when it comes to pursuing and having the American dream, one thing is certain since 2008. Many people have felt heartbroken as the American dream of owning their own home slipped through their fingers. Some cases, maybe the faults were those people out there buying mortgages that, well, just quite work within their reach. And others could be just circumstances about how banks operate. After all, there seems to be a lot of rules and regulations and things that favor them, while at the same time leaving the consumer on the mortgage side standing still in the water what to do next. On the Beyond 50 radio program, as many of you have listened to us over the years, we'd like to talk about a particular thing known as cooperative economics. What would happen if there was a company out there that actually helps people get out of those distressed debt business areas of their American dream of owning their home and actually kept them in their homes while at the same time saving them as well? Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is partner, senior partner excuse me, of what is known as the Apollo Financial Group, He's going to be talking about how we can deal with non-performing bank notes. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program our guest, Ricky Brava. Ricky, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. I would think with what you're doing, you look forward to each and every day, don't you? Uh, yes, I, I'm a, in a blessed position mm. to be part of this business and um, because uh, I haven't seen something that is as agreeable uh, personally as this, meaning that it gives me the ability to create wealth and also save people's homes. So it's, it's like a, to- a really uh, win-win situation for us. <laughs> it's always nice to hear that when the win actually wins on both sides of the column rather than just the one side. And then there's a great story that glosses over the other side, isn't it? Yes, definitely. <laughs> now, I, there must have been something personal that might have happened with you where you kind of moved in this direction with your life? Well, um, my business partner and I, uh, prior to the crash, we were on the other side of real estate. And um, as you all know, things were doing going really well, and uh, we, we, we overextended ourselves, you know, uh, picking up more and more properties. And uh, then the crash came, and uh, we couldn't maintain those properties. And then, lo and behold, the banks foreclosed on them and took over those assets. So that gave us the realization of who really owns the uh, the assets, the properties. It's the banks. It's not the homeowner, in essence, uh, until you pay off that mortgage. So that that get, that sort of woke us up. Um, we're from New York City, uh, and we're based out of New York City, so we had uh, a great relationship with people that were working on Wall Street, Wall Street firms that uh, dealt in this business as well prior, and then they, you know, opened their eyes to this opportunity. For instance, what non-performing bank notes are? Bank performing mortgage notes. Um, To put it simply so one can follow, anyone listening today can follow, is when you want to buy a house, the first thing you do is you go to the bank. Uh, You get approved for a loan, which then becomes your mortgage, and uh, and you have a note on that mortgage, which states uh, the payment arrangements of said mortgage. But uh, a lot of times, as people know in today's society, Especially after 2008, the economy went down and people stopped paying their mortgage. And that becomes a non-performing note, a mortgage note. It's non-performing, meaning that it's, it's not being paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that people can relate to that. You may or may not know someone who has been in that situation where they cannot pay their mortgages. And um, now you turn that around as investors, we have that ability to pick up those said mortgages that are not being paid at a steep discount mm-hmm. because they're toxic in a, you know, for in lame terms, people say, Oh, that's not a good deal because it's not being paid. Why would I want to pick something up that's not being paid? Right. Right. Uh, but the beauty of it is that because it's not being paid, uh, you know, you want to look at life and you want to look at things. Okay, something is wrong. What is? What, uh, there's a problem here. But out of all problems, and I know this from my personal life as well, it's there's always a solution and something always better comes out of it. This was created. This this economic recession and happened 
and all these non-performing mortgages um, started to happen. People could not pay their loans. That's a big issue. That's a problem. People were getting foreclosed and losing their homes. But at the same time, that gave birth to this business, which is for a, a, an investor, a savvy investor, to come in and pick those loans that are because they're not being paid, picking them up at a big discount. To give you a, a, a lame scenario of how this would work is if the property uh, value, is, just keep it simple, it's $100,000. The house is worth $100,000, and the homeowner owes the bank one fifty. That means that that's an underwater property. Um, now, because he has not paid that loan, an investor like ourselves, our company, and those associated with us can pick up that said loan, let's say, at $50,000. So you see the discount? Right. And now because we picked it up at a discount, now we better than anyone can work in better terms with that homeowner so he now can also now afford to stay in his current home. Everybody is a different situation. Mm. Everybody has a different ec economic reality, as I like to say. It does not mean that they're bad people. It does not mean that they're just not paying because they don't want to. Something ha Things happen, and we know everybody in America has gone through some ups and downs with unemployment and things of that nature. So things do happen, but because we came in at a vast discount as investors, we can give that person now the new opportunity to make good or just give him uh, whatever the issue was that they couldn't pay to give them better terms so they can now start paying and stay in that property, uh, continue the American dream of home ownership, and also at that when that scenario happens, it also makes us very profitable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. It's interesting. So it sounds like the old way of doing things could have been one of those areas that got us in trouble in the first place. And as a result, this created, as you said, a bird the new industry where there's a different way that we can look at doing things. Is that kind of how it looks like in, in general terms? Yes. Um, it, it, it is. A, it's a new, well, a new way. As a homeowner or, or a person who's just uh, let's, uh, uh, a regular Joe that, you know, wants to live, you know, he has his nine to five. He wants to have a property, and, and that's good. Everyone should want to own their home because it's good for them. But they, like I tell everyone, this would not be an issue if people really focused on doing their homework before they borrowed. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, uh, banks did in the past uh, lend, lend to people that should have not borrowed, and that's why we got into this situation. But um, everybody has responsibilities. The bank has a responsibility. The, the borrower has a responsibility. And uh, I think that it, if everybody took it upon themselves to be responsible, we probably wouldn't have had such a mess. That's the mess that we are still clearing up. Even though things are getting better, it's still a big mess that needs to be cleared up. Now, you know, here's the interesting thing, too. What we're talking about or what it appears to be in buying these bank notes, uh, it's sort of like a second mortgage. And some people might think, well, Someone going into that with investment capital would see that as being risky after all. You know, the first mortgage didn't seem to pan out very well, but as you laid out the scenario, you're able to come in there at a significant discount, yes. which gives you a lot of position for perhaps an owner to work in earnest, so you're actually more directly involved with, call it the asset, if you will, I guess is the best yes. way I can think about it. Well, no, um, it's a good point that you bring up, uh, Daniel. The thing is that we deal in first position notes uh, at Apollo Financial Group. And I know there's people that do seconds. There's a, such a thing as first position and second position. Apollo Financial Group, we focus on first position only. Now, when obviously, we've done seconds. I'm very familiar with both um, asset classes. That, like you said, the difference would be it's security on investment. If I pick up a first position not performing, you know, at the end of the day, if I did my proper due diligence, I know that one or two things will happen. Either as an investor, we're going to work something out and it's going to be good for uh, the both of us, the homeowner and the investor, or unfortunately I will have to take over your, your property, which then again as the investor is going to be good for you because, you, again, you came in at a steep discount on the first position. On the second position, yes, the, um, there are – 
it's riskier as far as like you could be wiped out, for example, from the first things. You could lose a lot of equity really fast. But um, a lot, I know a lot of guys that do really well by working with the homeowner mm-hmm. and working out because again they come at a uh, even a bigger discount, right? Uh, right. on the second position, to work something out with that homeowner. And, um, and you'll find that a lot of people do want to make uh, good on their their loans. Uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, most Americans are hardworking. I believe that most of us are moral and want to do good by, you know, what, what you owe. But if, if you need help, ideally, you want to get one of these companies that are involved in this business, they're the companies that can really help you because I know a lot of banks are not suited to do so mm-hmm. or, or they have the manpower to do so uh, and, then, and or that's not their business model. Mm-hmm. You know, I always found that interesting too about banks is the fact that when you go to take a loan out on a home, they talk about all this risk they're taking on and I think that as people over the last, you know, eight, ten years, have really kind of put a a microscope on banking. They realize, what risk do these people really take? They're using other people's money. You know, they're basically getting a property that they're, they're, you know, selling to a consumer that if the consumer doesn't come through, they just kind of take the property back. And we know that they're not homeowners as far as banks are concerned, but there's really no risk there. <laughs> you know, it kind of leaves you scratching no. the head. You know, do they create all of this language to confuse it so much? Because I think one of the biggest problems to me was the fact that they had complicated the language in these contracts to the point where you didn't know what you were going to be paying on your mortgage. You know, we're going to get you in here where it looks like you can afford it now, but then we're going to hammer you two years down the road. And and it just leaves you scratching your head. But at the same time, what you're saying, Ricky, clearly is, why don't you people do your homework? Yes, Daniel, you're 100% correct because you have to, as an adult, you, you, this is an adult uh, decision. You want to buy a home. Right. You you want to borrow so much money. It's a lot of money we're talking about. We're not talking about $2,000. We're talking about, you know, 50 and upwards, depending on, on where you're located. But... It, that amount of capital deserves that amount of um, focus mm-hmm. because it will affect your life, whether positively or negatively. So uh, you have to focus on what you're doing when it comes to moving that type of capital around. And I think a lot of people fail uh, in their due diligence as the borrower or and as the investor in, in our situation. Mm-hmm. Now, taking the focus off of the homeowner, the possibility that as our listeners out there realize, well, this is something I could look into because it might help me keep my American dream, let's look at the other side from an investor's point of view because this is clearly where you're taking a look at something, not from the consumer end, but from the investment end. How is the language different? Well, the language is different as, um, here's the fortunate, unfortunate. The, uh, you, you spoke about the borrower uh, on, on this sentence. The borrower, it, he has to try to figure out what entity owns that loan, and maybe they can work something out. In, re- in reality, they don't have that much control once they've defaulted that much. It, it all depends on, hey, the investor or the bank. Let's call them the bank because I, when, you be, when you're buying notes, you be, in essence, become the banking, the bank. Uh, because now you're the new lender, you've taken, you know, you've gotten a, the assignment of title, I mean, assignment to that note. Um, you can, there's different type of investors out there. And let's be honest and real. There, there's aggressive investors who want to look at that loan and that asset. I'm going to buy this note at a discount because I'm going to take over that property at, you know, at, sure. at a giveaway price in reality. The buy low, sell high if I can. <laughs> yes, and, and they have those, you know. And then there's the um, investors that have the more seem to have the moral obligation to help, mm-hmm. which is what we try to do all the time is try to really work because both both scenarios are profitable. Now, if you want to look at it as on the investor side, the most important thing in this business is to do your due diligence. Mm-hmm. Meaning, 
you want to make sure that it's an actual mortgage in order on that property. You want to make sure that the assignments are in order. You want to make sure that you can actually assess the value of that because it's asset-based investment. You're, you're, you're buying debt, right? Sure. You could buy debt. You could buy any type of debt. You could buy credit card debt, debt all that type, any type of debt. But this, the difference is with this debt is that this debt happens to be secured by real estate. Sure. Which makes it very appeal uh, appealing. But you have to do your homework. You have to make sure that house is, let's say, worth a hundred thousand and not forty and you buy the note for forty. You understand? Right. So that that that's the um, the most important thing. Pretty fascinating stuff. Is there anything that frustrates you about the things that you have to do? On my end, um I frustrating is when we try to get a hold of a homeowner to see if we can work something out. And the frustration comes when you know that there is a homeowner and they won't talk or they won't communicate with the attorneys. Hmm. That's frustrating. I can because imagine. I know, and if I know that their monthly mortgage payment, let's say for argument's sake, it's only $300, right, on a single family, and they still don't want to communicate. They don't understand that I may give them a great new deal because they may have arrears. They think, oh, I'm behind ten, twenty thousand dollars. There's no way I can fix this, you know. Um, but people should try to. If someone tries to reach out, they should start communication so the person knows where they are. It's frustrating to me when I know that. Hey, listen, let's just forget. Let's put your arrears on the side for now. Start paying your mortgage, you know, 300 a month, which I know that if I have to foreclose on you and take over your, your house, you're going to end up paying rent somewhere else, and you're going to end up paying $600 a month for rent. Mm -hmm. You understand? So that's really frustrating to me when that happens. It does happen. A lot of times people do not reach back and end up losing their homes just because they didn't want to have that dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why, um, because I know maybe they try to have that di dialogue before with some banks, and some banks wouldn't, but not every, not every institution is, works that way. So it's important to get um, communication going, uh, or else it becomes frustrating because, like I said, it's, it's not my main goal to take over the asset. Mm -hmm. Now, have you felt this to be successful from an investor's point of view, when you say it's profitable for both sides, what if somebody out there listening today thinks, you know, I didn't think about taking money and investing it in this direction. You know, what does that look like for somebody who might explore it from that point of view? Well, it's when I, look, the numbers that you can run up here as an investor are very high. Mm -hmm. And at times, uh, unbelievable. And trust me, I was on that side of the fence as well. Because I know if you do like rental properties, you get like 10, 12% profit return uh, uh, if things go well. Uh, here, they, they go well over 20 at times, 20%. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, that sounds like a ridiculously high number, but it, it does happen. And what you want to do is educate yourself first. Mm -hmm. Just like anything else, you don't want to just jump into this and hey, listen, I heard Ricky speak about loans, notes, non-performing notes. It looks like I want, I got some capital I want to get involved with. Sure, we're we're here to handhold you at Apollo Financial Group. We do that often. That's fine, but educate yourself. There's many um, conferences, seminars, just like other other forms of real estate out there, uh, where you can learn. For, and I would say just try to learn as much as you can, and then everybody has a different starting point, and based on yours, you know how to work this business. I know when you talk with or read books from people who are considered to be masters of investing, there's one consistent uh, thing they say over and over, and that is one of the biggest concerns people have is about risk. Uh, apparently there's something within us that believes when we take an action, it should be a sure thing. <laughs> but we all know in life that just isn't the way it works. But what they talk about consistently is learning to manage the risk that you're taking. And as you've said over and over, 
get out there and do your due diligence. You know, go out and research these things before you take that obvious step. It, it amazes me when you catch on the evening news, the little old lady or the couple that whines and, and cries about how they've got taken because it was an investment. Somebody came along and told them that it was this great investment. They believed them, and of course we know the greed factor kicks in, and they probably were telling the truth as far as sharing the information with these potential investors were concerned. But the fact is we lock in that greatest scenario and believe that's the only way it's going to happen. And it's fascinating to me, and I'm sure you've seen this a lot, within your business and how emotion really gets in the way of logic when this can be such a logical way to follow things. Yes, definitely. This is a very, I'm glad you said that. Uh, this is a very logic driven business. It's a, it's a numbers business. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't even go to the point of like, Oh, this is a bad neighborhood or undesirable neighborhood. No, if the numbers make sense, they make sense. Mm -hmm. And um, once you understand your numbers, try to stick with that criteria and, and then do something. And, and at the end of the day, you could read about swimming all day, but if you don't jump in the water, you're <laughs> not going to learn how to swim. And, if you, and uh, if you realize you're jumping into salt water, you're not going to learn that there might be sharks there as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, well, you could read about it, but you have to actually experience this, these things. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, whether you're successful in, in any investment vehicle or you fail in any investment vehicle, it's not, it's not anyone's fault but your own. Mm -hmm. So don't ever uh, try to, like I tell people, don't, don't give so much credit to someone for teaching you something or don't discredit someone for teaching you something. At the end of the day, like we spoke in the, earlier in the conversation, the 2008 scenario, mm -hmm. you are that adult making that adult decision. Do your homework. Read. That amount of capital deserves that amount of focus. Mm -hmm. Now, just so we could be sure clearly that you want to let our listeners know what this is all about, why don't we go ahead and rehash that from your own words? What this is about? Yes. Uh, investing in, in non-performing notes, right. mortgage notes. It's... Um, for me and for my experience, it's been a win-win vehicle as an investor because this gives you the ability to purchase loans at a discount and thus creating the ability to help and work with that homeowner, stay in their homes, and create better terms for them, thus still creating a great return on your investment capital. Mm -hmm. So I, I do view this as a win-win, and um, if you're... And I tell this to people because I, I if, if not to make it sound political, but let, let's be honest, we're in the United States. This is an amazing country, and uh, I love it for everything that it offers me and my family. If you are looking to be in a, if you are at the position that you're an investor, that you have a portfolio, whether you're doing stocks or other forms of real estate, and you stumble upon this. Um, Really look into it because you can actually help people here. You can save one home at a time. And not just us, not just Apollo Financial Group, but every investor that gets involved in this vehicle has that ability to help save one home at a time and thus creating a better nation for ourselves and our children. And I think that beyond that, I mean... It's, it's a remarkable opportunity that I don't know how long the discounts will last. So my uh, curiosity about this, too, is this. Um, since you've been involved with this business, mm -hmm. what would you say the default rate has been in your experience with this? Meaning, um, the amount of people that the... just couldn't come through when you started working with them. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, like, out of ten people that you may have stepped in and said, hey, you know, we can work this out, you can stay in your home if you're willing to do these things. Three to four, um, 30 to 40 uh, percent. Three out of ten, three to four times I, uh, we end up with the property. Mm -hmm. See, and so most people work something out. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because the reason I wanted to bring that up is a lot of times 
when people, especially first-time home buyers, is that what you tend to see a lot of as first-time home buyers? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it isn't somebody who's bought a home before. They've got some experience, and they've probably figured out how to keep themselves from watching this thing go down the drain. But most of the people you've worked with have been first-time home buyers, just to be clear, right? Yeah, not investors. Okay. But yeah, and, and the reason I'm asking that question is, I remember reading an interesting study about people who tend to default on loans of any kind. It doesn't matter if it's a bank or it's somebody that you know, that more often if you have a really good relationship, even a friendship with someone, that you're more likely to pay that money back, even if things get stressed and it may take some time, but you're more likely to work it out than you are with somebody that you don't know, for instance, a credit card company or maybe a bank trying to get you into a home. And so you see someone like you that comes along, and you sort of save them. At least that's the perception. I can see why your percentages of defaults would be much, much lower than the bank's experience with first-time home buyers. Yeah, because that, that's our first, first goal. Mm -hmm. of, that's our mode of operation. That's our first goal is to reach out, listen. It does not mean that, you know, as an investor, we, I have to look at the whole map. Mm -hmm. With anyone I work with, I know that, hey, listen, this investor has to make money. I, we have to make a profit. But, okay, that's, we put that in motion because we did the numbers before we, we acquired that note, the, the asset, right? Good. Now now's the second most important part. Like, can we work something out? And because we want to do that first, we make it easier. And people, I think people can see that and perceive that and understand that once we uh, start talking. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff here, Ricky. Is there a website people can find out more? Yes, there's actually, I'll give you two websites if you don't mind, Daniel. Um, no, no. The first one is ApolloFinancialGRP.com. That's ApolloFinancialGRP.com. You could get a lot of information there. And also, there is MortgageFloat.com. That's www mortgagefloat.com. Uh, you can check out both websites. Uh, they're both based on notes, mortgage notes. And uh, I do speak around the country on the subject matter. So please, uh, you know, feel free to Google my name, Ricky Brava of Apollo Financial Group, and see where I may be speaking next. And uh, this is what I do. I've been doing this for eight years now. Well, it sounds like your name has become you, Brava. It sounds like a, a nice little <laughs> cheer from all the people that you've been able to help out there on both sides. Oh, man, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I feel blessed. I honestly do. Um, it's been a great situation. It's not of my doing. You know, sometimes you're at the right place at the right time, right. and you have to take advantage in, um, when opportunity strikes. And I wanted to ask you, too, uh, as we got about two minutes left here, is how do you see the future of something like this? I think that the future does look good. Um, I, I, I know that that's an, on the investor side. If I see the future, I think that we have only a limited amount of years left. As the economy starts to turn, you know, God willing, the economy is turning, meaning that our discounts as um, buying these loans are going to be less and less. Instead of getting 40, uh, 50 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar, they're going to go up and up to 80 mm -hmm. cents on the dollar. You understand? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's only a couple of years left So as an investor. Does that mean that the business will go away? No, it will not go away, just that the profit margins will be a little smaller. Oh, okay, very good. Well, Ricky, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. No, I really appreciate it, Daniel. Thank you so much. You bet. And for those listeners out there, that website, again, is Apollo Financial GRP. Dot com and the other is mortgagefloat.com, if I remember that. We'll be sure to have that on our website for you at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Thank you for joining us here on the program today. I'm Daniel Davis, and remember, live your day past halfway.